Chapter 19, we're going to get into the respiratory emergencies. Topics, we're going to talk about respiration. We're going to talk about breathing difficulties. Respiratory conditions, the prescribed inhaler, and the small volume nebulizer. Respirations. The A and P, uh, to move air, the respiratory changes pressure. We've talked about this. When you breathe in, your diaphragm contracts, your chest expands, and you create a negative pressure, which which moves air in through diff a diffusion process. And then when you breathe out, everything relaxes, and the air moves out. Inspiration is an active process. We have to contract muscles to increase the size of the chest. Uh, the intercostal and diaphragm are the ones that contract. Diaphragm lowers, rib move upwards and outwards, air is pulled into the lungs. Uh, you should have a pretty good grasp or understanding on what inspiration and expiration and how it works at this point. Expiration is a passive process, which means it doesn't require any work. Uh, everything relaxes, right? The rib muscles and diaphragm. The chest cavity will decrease in its size and the air will naturally flow out of the lungs. Uh, adequate breathing. This is breathing that will support life, right? It, they're breathing well enough that they will maintain life. Uh, some of the signs, they have their mental status. is going to be normal and they're moving air when they breathe. They'll be able to uh, speak relatively normal without having to catch your breath in between words or every other word. And their collar and oxygen saturation is going to be typically in the normal range, right? So they're going to be, they should be close to pink, warm, and dry, and their oxygen level should be within the normal ranges. Uh, so we have to determine by observation the rate, rhythm, and quality. Remember, 12 to 20 breaths per minute is the normal rate for an adult. 18 to 30 is for school-age children, 30 to 60 for infants. A rhythm should be regular on a regular interval. And breath sounds should be normal, present, and equal. On the flip side, inadequate breathing. This is breathing that's not sufficient. Um, it's not bringing in enough oxygen to perfuse, so it's not sufficient for, to support life and if we don't do something about it quickly usually it goes into respiratory failure right i'm sorry excuse me this is respiratory failure it'll go into respiratory arrest signs the rate's out of range is either too fast or slow and irregular patient won't be able to speak without having to stop and catch your breath and there's a silent chest which means you uh you don't hear an ear uh, you have low oxygen saturations, that even despite the fact that you've got them on uh, nasal cannula or non-rebreather, they're still low. They may have agonal respirations. This is like a uh, really low-rated respiratory rate, you know, like four or six breaths per minute. We call it carping in, in the uh, EMS world. It looks like a fish out of water. Irreg irregular rhythms. Uh, they could have diminished or even absent lung sounds, and they'll have poor tidal volume. Now, let's talk about the pediatrics. Remember, uh, they differ; their airway structure differs from adult. Uh, smaller, easily more easily obstructed. They have larger tongues, great big tongues, compared to the rest of the size of their airway. Their tracheas are softer, more flexible, smaller. So it's easier for them to get obstructed or even torn. Uh, they have less rigid or, or developed cricoid cartilage. And they're a big time uh, dependent on their diaphragm for breathing. So their intercostal muscles aren't as developed, so they don't work as well. So they depend on this diaphragm to breathe more. Um, inadequate breathing in infants and children, right? Nasal flaring, grunting. Seesaw breathing uh, and retraction. Seesaw breathing is where the belly goes out and the chest goes out. The belly, chest, belly, chest, back and forth. Seesaw. And retraction is when we see sunken in areas where they're really working to breathe, like up in the clavicle area in between the ribs. Those intercostal space will all be sunk in and they're really hard to breathe. They're retracting. Um, 
Inadequate breathing, we're going to assist with ventilation, right? With, with supplemental oxygen. Uh, remember the three ways we got a pocket mask, we have two rescuer and one rescuer BVM. And remember, out of all of them, the best is probably two rescuer uh, bag valve mask, bag valve mask with supplemental oxygen. Uh, adequate versus inadequate artificial ventilation. So, how do we know if you're doing good ventilating or if you're ventilating the patient when you're using artificial ventilations? You're going to see chest rise and fall should be visible with each breath and it should be equal on both sides. And we're going to have an adequate rate, 12, 10 to 12 on adults and 12 to 20 for infants and children. Um, remember that a good sign of inadequate artificial ventilation is the heart rate is going to raise in adults and it's going to decrease in pediatric patients. So if we're not ventilating properly or we're doing it inadequately, their pulse is going to go up in adults and the pulse is going to go down in children. Breathing problems, breathing difficulties. Um, this is filling of labor or difficulty breathing, right? They have a feeling that they're, you know, they can't catch their breath. They have labored breathing. Uh, amount of distress may or may not reflect actually the severity of the condition. Uh, anxiety plays a big role in this. Um, they're a little anxious because they, they can't seem to catch their breath. So they may think it's a lot worse than what it is. Or maybe on the flip side, they're um, they're portraying that it's not as bad as what it really is. Here's a good sign of distress, right? Uh, this is this guy's sitting in a tripod position, uh, mouth kind of open. He looks like he's having trouble breathing or catching his breath. Uh, questions we're going to ask for the OPQRS. We want to know when the difficulty breathing began. We're going to know what they were doing when this came on. Were they out running a marathon, raking the yard? Were they just sitting around watching TV? We want to know if it has a cough. And if they are coughing, are they producing anything or bringing anything up? And then we're going to note that, especially the collar, right? Green, yellow, it's going to be white and frothy. So we're going to note what, what color this um, sputum is. Radiate, do you have pain anywhere? Or is it moving, right? On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad do you think your breathing problem is? And how long have you been feeling like this? Okay, so we're going to be observing. So we're looking for an altered mental status with breathing difficulty because that's a sign of inadequate breathing. We're going to look for unusual anatomy like barrel chesting. This comes from especially our COPD ears. Our chest is actually evolved or uh, moving so it creates more surface area, so it can actually create that negative pressure. Uh, patient's position, are they sitting in a tripod position? Or are they sitting with their feet dangling, leaning forward? We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Work of breathing, do we see any re retraction? Are they using any accessory muscles? Do we have flared nostrils, purged lips? Or a number of words the patient can say without stopping. These are all signs of inadequate or difficulty breathing. Pale cyanotic or flushed skin. Uh, if we see any swelling in the like lower extremities and around the ankle or the sacral in the lower back area. And our oxygen saturations are reading less than 95%. Uh, this picture is in about every book you've ever seen. Uh, he's got kind of that barrel chest we talked about. He's sitting in a tripod, purged lips. This guy's obviously having some... Uh, Difficulty breathing. Nasal, noisy breathing, audible wheezing, heard when stethoscope. We are gurgling, snoring, strider, coughing. We also take lung sounds on both sides during inspiration and expiration. Here's a picture of it. Now, what are these, these lung sounds we keep talking about? What do they mean? Wheezing, they're a high pitched sound that is created because the bronchi are starting to swell up or they're narrowed. So the patches what passageways are getting narrowed. So that makes a really high pitched sound. Crackles are a fine crackling or bubbling sound you heard on inspiration. It's because there's fluid there in the alveoli. Um it sounds really bubbly. Bronchi is a low pitched sound 
resembling a snoring or rattling. This is caused by secretion in the larger airway. So on our bronchi and bronchioli, but mainly the bronchi have got a bunch of secretion in there, and they'll get that ronchi sound. And striders that high-pitched upper airway obstruction sound or partially obstructed, usually in the trachea or the larynx. Uh, evaluating vital signs, which may include increase or decrease in your pulse rate, change in your respiratory rate, change in their breathing rhythm, or hyper or hypotension. We're, we're monitoring vital signs for these changes. Uh, let's take care of our patient, breathing difficulties. We're going to assure that they have adequate ventilation. So if they are ventilating adequately, we may do supplemental oxygen if they have lower SpO2. If their breathing is inadequate, we're going to begin ventilation, usually a BVM. If breathing is adequate, we're going to use a non rebreather at 15 liters or a nasal cannula at 6. <clears throat> Place the patient in a position of comfort. Usually they like to sit up a little bit. We're going to help them with the prescribed inhaler. And we're going to use CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure if need be. Now let's talk about that continuous, continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. It's a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation that consists of a mask in a way that oxygen or air is blown into the mask. Um, with this continuous air, low pressure airflow, it'll help the alveoli from collapsing, and it'll also prevent any flood from filling up in the alveoli. It'll push it back out into the third spacing, which opens it up for the gas exchange to happen. Common uses, these are the patient we're gonna use them on. The uh, pulmonary edema, or the really, really wet lung sounds. Uh, drownings, again, they'll have water or wet lung sound. Asthma and COPD patients and respiratory failure in general. Now, we do have some contraindications for using CPAP. They can't be severely altered. They have to have some spontaneous respirations or this won't work. They have to be able to set up. And they cannot have hypotension or be in a shocky state. Um, if their systolic blood pressure is below 90, according to this book, you cannot put CPAP. That's a definite contraindication. Nausea and vomiting. We don't want to put this on there because if they do vomit, that positive pressure is going to push that vomits down into the airway and cause an aspiration or an aspirated pneumonia. If we have any type of chest trauma, we can't use this pressurized system because it's going to make that trauma worse if we have a pneumothorax or whatever. If they're in shock, their pressure will be low, and we're going with this will, in general, will lower their blood pressure because the way it works, it not only does this positive pressure affect the lungs, but it also affects the filling of the heart. If they had any upper GI bleeding or recent gastric surgeries, again, due to the pressure, some of this is going to go down into their belly. And anything that will prevent a good mass seal, like a really thick, bushy beard, facial trauma, stuff like that. Side effects of CPAP. They could go hypotensive, so we got to monitor them. We could cause them pneumothorax, especially in a weakened lung already or in trauma. There is an increased risk of aspiration if they would happen to vomit. And we can dry of the carinas. Um, and we could dry out the wetness of this lung that is supposed to be a little wet. So we could dry them out. To use CPAP, we're going to explain it to the patient. We're going to tell them this is going to be a tight seal around the face. Uh and then we're going to start with low level of CPAP, low low pressure or PEEP, usually around 5, and then we work ourselves up to 10. Ours will go from 5 to 10 centimeters of uh, water is how we measure it. I normally try to start at 5. We like to leave it lower. If they are maintaining or getting better on 5, we'll leave it at 5.
We're going to reassess the patient's vital signs or mental status, uh, their dyspnea, dyspnea at levels frequently. Dyspnea is uh, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. Uh, we're going to raise the CPAP level if no relief within a few minutes. And I, I'm not going to talk specifically about CPAP or your CPAP on this or in this video because there's so many different styles. Uh, you just have to learn which one you're carrying. Some are oxygen driven, which means you start them off on lower oxygen, like 10 liters a minute. It'll go to five peep, go to like 12. It'll go to seven and a half of peep. And you go to 15, it'll go to 10 peep. And others, you just put them on 15 and you dial in the peep that you want. If the patient's starting to deteriorate, blood pressure starts to drop, uh, they're not tolerating the mask, we're going to remove the CPAP and begin ventilation with the BVM. Or if they go unresponsive or altered at any point. Let's talk about specific respiratory conditions. Let's start off with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. It's a broad classification of a chronic lung disease. Uh, emphysema chronic bronchitis, and other uh, respiratory illnesses are in this group. Uh, the overwhelming majority of cases are caused by cigarette smoking. Chronic bronchitis is the bronchioli linings are inflamed, so they start to swell. They start creating excessive mucus. And the cells that are uh, designed to sweep away or clear this mucus are orking. So they just get more mucus and more mucus and they're swelling. So it shuts off their airway in, in the lower, smaller bronchoi. Emphysema, uh, the VOI walls break down. So surface area for gas exchange is reduced, greatly reduced. The lungs itself will lose their elasticity. So it won't be able to expand. So they it will result in laden, air laden with carbon dioxide being trapped in the lungs. So normal breathing will be uh, reduced. All right, let's go to asthma. Well, let's go back one. Uh, when we're talking about COPD, uh, they talk about hypoxic drive. Some of these people, they retain, since everything is swollen and all the mucus, they retain a lot of CO2 or carbon dioxide. Uh, so eventually their brain switches from detecting CO2 in their bloodstream and wanting to breathe more and it converts to a CO2 monitoring. So sometimes if in severe cases, uh, their brain will detect higher levels of oxygen because we're given supplemental oxygen and will actually knock out their respiratory drive. So uh, it's not that big of an issue with EMS. Usually this takes a, a period of time that we don't, we're not in contact with the patient for that long. So we just, we never withhold oxygen. So if they need it, we give it to them. Asthma is a chronic disease with uh, episodic, uh, episodic exacerbation um, caused by activity, um, emotion. There's a bunch of causes. Usually uh, we see it more in child, children. Uh, but some adults still have asthma. During the, the attack, the small bronchi will narrow or the bronchial constriction, and the mucus will go into overproduction. Uh, and these smaller areas will close down and will restrict the airflow. Uh, airflow mainly restricted in one direction, coming in. So inhalation, the expanding lungs, Exert outward pulling, outward pull, increased diameter of air and allowing airflow into the lung. Opposite occurs and air becomes trapped in the lungs. Pulmonary edema is abnormal accumulation of fluid in the expression of the uvi. We see this a lot in our congestive heart failure patients, or CHF, or now just mainly known as heart failure. And because this fluid is backflowing into their lungs because the left side of their heart has been damaged and it's not pumping properly 
then it'll backflow into the lungs and where the VI, this fluid will will actually eventually get into the VI and then we don't have gas exchange. Uh, pressure builds up the pulmonary artery, fluid crosses the thin membrane and accumulates in the VI. And occupying lower airways make it difficult for oxygen to reach blood and they experience difficulty breathing. Common signs and symptoms of pulmonary edema. They have difficulty breathing or dyspnea. Uh, they'll become very anxious. If you can't breathe, you get anxious, right? They could be pale and sweaty. You may see tachycardia and hypertension. Uh, respirations can be rapid and labored, and they'll have low oxygen saturation. Uh, in the severe cases, we can hear gurgling even without a uh, stethoscope or without oscillating. Uh, crackles or sometimes or wheezing may be audible. I call this the percolated respirations because for my, all my older uh, viewers or followers, they'll know what I'm talking about. The old percolator coffee pots back in the day, they made a sound. Well, this is what it kind of reminds me of, that gurgling sound. Uh, they may be coughing up a frothy sputum. It's usually white, but it can be pink tinged. How do we treat this pulmonary edema? We're going to assess and treat for inadequate breathing. So if they're not breathing adequately, we're going to ventilate for them. High flow, concentrated oxygen. Uh, if possible, we're going to keep people, their patient's legs in a dependent position off the side of the cot. That'll restrict some of this fluid from coming back. Take some load off the heart. And C CPAP can be used to push the fluid out of the lungs and back into the capillaries. Pneumonia is an infection of one or both lungs. It can be either back caused by bacteria. It could be a viral or fungal. It results from you breathing in a certain uh, microbes. Then these microbes that can grow in the lungs and cause inflammation. Signs of shortness of breath with or without exertion. Cough. They'll usually have some sort of fever or severe chills. They could have chest pain. It's usually very sharp and, and pleurit, which means when they breathe in, it gets worse. They'll have a headache sometimes, pale, sweaty skin, fatigue, confusion. How do we treat pneumonia? Care is mostly supportive, right? It's just to treat inadequate breathing. So if they're not breathing properly, we're going to breathe for them. If they're hypoxic, we're going to give supplemental oxygen. Um, in some systems, DMT can put a CPAP for these patients. That's You have to check your protocol once you get uh, working in the field, and then you can go from there. Uh, and in some cases, it can be so severe that we have to give artificial ventilation. Spontaneous pneumothorax. It's a lung collapsing without injury or any other obvious sign. It's just they didn't fall and get hurt. It just... Suddenly they have a, a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. People with, at higher risk are patients with COPD or a history of smoking. And tall, thin people. Signs are sharp, uh, pleuritic pain, which means when they breathe in, they get really sharp, sudden, shortness of breath. So it's a sudden onset of sharp pain, especially one-sided. and uh, shortness of breath. They're easily tired. They'll have low uh, oxygen saturation. They'll be cyanotic. They will have a high heart rate or tachycardia. They'll be breathing fast. You will hear decreased or absent lung sounds on one side. The side that's injured. And when it gets worse or very late signs of a pneumo is that JVD or those jugular vein distensions, the ones your neck will be showing up. Uh, hypertension and then a very 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 late sign is tracheal deviation which means your trachea will actually because of the pressure build up on one side will shift to the uninjured side so if you ever seen anybody that that trachea is not midline or in the center of their neck it's off to one side you see jvd they have low blood pressure chest pain you can almost bet that it's a pneumothorax treatment we're going to get aos immediately because they need to decompress this patient
administer oxygen. Do not do CPAP. You're going to make that injury worse and the problems inside their chest even worse. And if it's closer to take them to definitive care, um, as to wait for your AOS intercept, just take them to the hospital. A pulmonary embolism, or we call it PEs, is a blockage in the blood supply to the lungs, commonly caused by DVTs or deep vein thrombosis. So these are blood clots that develop in the legs, usually by people that are stagnant or people that are sitting for long periods of time, like truck drivers are a good example, or people that are like bed confined. Uh, could get these DVTs. Uh, so lying or sitting in the same position for extended period, uh, have an active cancer, or being having a limb immobilized in a cast for a while, you're at higher risk. So if you break your femur and you're in a cast for a while, you're at a risk to develop a DVT. Uh, sudden pleuric chest pain, shortness of breath, so sudden, just like the pneumothorax, sudden onset, sudden difficulty of breathing. They'll be very anxious because they can't breathe. They could be coughing, tachycardia, tach tachynapnea, tachynapnea, which is fast breathing. They could be lightheaded or dizziness. This comes from that fast breathing. Pain or swelling in one or both legs. That's a good sign of DVTs. And it could be in hypotensive or at cardiac arrest. Treatment, difficult to diagnose in the fill, right? Uh, we're going to administer oxygen, treat them like anyone else with shortness of breath, transport to definitive care. Uh, epiglottitis is in the swelling of the epiglottis, around or above the epiglottis. Uh, in severe cases, swelling can cause an airway obstruction. Uh, these are the patients that we don't want to get too excited. And these we see these a lot in, in children. So we don't want to get them super excited. Um, you may not even do vitals because uh, you don't want to excite them. You can give supplemental oxygen if it's not going to upset your patient. Signs and symptoms, sore throat, painful, difficult to swallowing. Swallowing. They'll be sitting in a tripod position because they move that way. And that, that kind of takes some of the, the weight off and maybe opens that gotic opening a little bit. They'll look thick. They'll have a muffled voice, fever. There'll be excessive drooling. That's a big sign of epiglottitis is the excessive drooling. And you could hear the strider because it's partially obstructed. That high-pitched sound. Keep them calm and comfortable. Do not inspect the throat. We can give the uh, high concentrated oxygen with if we can do it without alarming our patient. And we're going to transport. Croup. Caused by a group of viral illnesses that result in inflammation of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. Tissues, especially in the airway, especially the upper airway, become inflamed or swollen, and they could restrict the passage, the, the airway passage. Signs is a loud barking cough. We call this the seal bark cough, or the, it sounds like a seal barking cough. Very hoarse voice. Um, associated with breathing difficulties, typically resolves when the child is moving the upright. So it happens a lot at night when they lay down or go to bed. Inadequate breathing, uh, indicated by signs of hypoxia, which is cyanosis, altered mental status. And they could have severe, significant uh, breathing difficulty, respiratory, like inspiratory strider. Uh, if treatment, so how do we treat the croup? If they're not, if they are inadequate breathing, we're going to artificially ventilate and rapid transport. If they're in respiratory distress but breathing adequately, we're going to call for AOS or advanced life support. Consider supplemental oxygen if they're hypoxic and allow the physician to remain in a position of comfort, which is usually sitting up. Uh, bronchiolitis is the small airways being inflamed, usually due to a viral infection. 
most common cause is something we're seeing right now is the respiratory uh, syncytial virus or RSV. Signs and symptoms commonly associated with other cold-like symptoms such as runny nose, fever, general illness. Uh, they Generally, symptoms typically progress over a few days and they gradually get worse until they go into respiratory distress. Um, common for multiple children in the same house to have the same symptoms. This is contagious, right? And can cause significant respiratory distress and progress into inadequate breathing to the point that we have to ventilate them. Artificial ventilation may be necessary. Uh, if they're hypoxic, we're going to give oxygen. We're going to consider using a bulb syringe to suction the nose if it's obstructed by mucus, especially in our smaller children because they're nose breathers. Uh, cystic fibrosis is a general disease typically appearing in childhood. Uh, this used to, um, they used to not have a very long lifespan if they had cystic fibrosis. Uh, but with the modern treatment and new technology, uh, they are starting to live longer lives. It causes this really thick, sticky mucus accumulation in your lungs and their digestive system. This music can cause life-threatening lung infections and serious digestive problems. Uh, signs and symptoms of cystic fibrosis, they'll be coughing with large amounts of mucus. They'll be coughing up a large amount of mucus. Uh, chronic fatigue. Uh, they'll get pneumonia frequently. They could have abdominal pain and discomfort because it's mucus in the digestive system. They can sometimes cough up blood. They'll be nauseous and there'll be there'll be some weight loss. Treatment. Uh, usually, the patient or the caregiver will have the best resource for the baseline assessment. They know what what this is all about and the best treatment. Uh, viral respiratory infections, infections of the respiratory tract, common in adults, affecting more than 17 billion people each year. This is like your flu. Often starts with a sore or scratchy throat, with sneezing, runny nose, and fatigue. They got fever and chills. Infection can spread in the lung, causing shortness of breath, and even pneumonia. Cough may be present. They may produce a yellow or greenish sputum. Uh, our treatment is supplemental, right? Supportive oxygen and bronchial dilators for wheezing, or dual nibs. Uh, infections is viral and antibiotics won't help. And good hygiene can prevent this viral respiratory infection. So um, if you wash your hands often, this will, because if you, someone has got this, they cough in their hands, you restrict their hand, you touch your nose, your eyes. That's an easy access point for this virus and get into your system and you're you get infected. But if you're frequent hand washing, this will help prevent this. Prescribed inhalers, they're meter dosed inhalers, which means it's going to provide the exact same dose every time you squeeze it. Uh, commonly prescribed for conditions causing bronchial constriction. So they're bronchial dilators. Here's a good example of, of an uh, inhaler. Uh, before we help with it, administer an inhaler, we're gonna make sure we do the five rights, right patient, right time, right medication, right dose, right route. Check the expiration date. We're gonna shake this inhaler up. We gotta make sure that the patient is alert enough to use it. Uh, spacers help. Uh, spacer is a device that you squeeze, you squeeze the inhaler, it's shooting a spacer, and then they can breathe in normally and it'll, it'll be administered at that point. Cause this is all timed. If you don't, if you gotta take a deep breath as you're you're taking in this inhaler. So if you don't do it right, it's just gonna collect in, in the mucal lining of your mouth and it won't do any good. Here's a good example of the spacer. They push down on the inhaler, it shoots in the spacer, and then they can breathe it in. It's kind of like an atomizer, sort of. Uh, have the patient inhale deeply. Have the patient put their lips in the, around the opening. 
Press the inhaler to activate the spray as the patient inhales, and the patient will hold their breath as long as they can. This will let that uh, medication absorb before they exhale and breathe it back out. Now, small volume nebulizers. These are our neb kits on our ambulance. Uh, most of these medications in these meter dosed inhalers can be used in a small volume nebulizer. Uh, what is nebulizing? It's running oxygen and air through liquid medications. Patients will breathe in the vapors. So this will produce a continuous flow of aerosolized medicine. So we don't have to worry about the timing as much. Much. The is amizing when they breathe in, they inhale it into the lungs, and it absorbs that way. Uh, it gives the patient greater exposure. Here's a good example of a dual neb or a, a neb treatment. Chapter review: Respiratory emergencies are common complaints for EMTs. They're high call volume, right? We get a lot of call for difficulty breathing. Um, it's important to understand the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, assessment, and care for people that are having breathing difficulty. Uh, patients with respiratory complaints may exhibit inadequate breathing. Remember, rapid respirations indicate serious conditions, including hypoxia, cardiac and respiratory problems, and shock. Very slow and shallow. Respirations are often the endpoint of a serious condition and are, are precursors of death, really. So really slow and, and shallow breathing, your patient is close to death, usually. So we have to fix that. The history usually provides significant information about the patient's condition. In addition to determine the permanent past history and medication, determine the patient's sign and symptoms, with detailed description, including an OPQRST and events leading up to this episode. Uh, important physical examination points include checking the patient's work of breathing, so their effort, inspecting the accessory muscle use, gathering pulse oximetry reading, assuring adequate or equal lung sounds bilaterally, uh, examining for excessive fluids, lungs, lungs ankles, and the abdomen, and we're going to gather vitals. Several medications are available that may help correct patient's difficulty breathing. Uh, determine the patient's breathing is adequate, inadequate, or absent. Choose the appropriate oxygenation or ventilation therapy. So if they're breathing adequately but have a lower SpO2, we're going to go with a cannula at 6 or non at 15. But inadequate breathing, we're going to BVM them. Uh, we're going to consider to assist the patient with the respiratory medications. You have to check your protocol and medications that may help the patient. And does the patient have a presentation and condition that may fit the protocol? All right, that'll do it for chapter 19. We'll come back with chapter 20. We'll see you then.